Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be back in Oslo. Um, last time I was here, it was on our reporting trip. I came with uh, President Shimon Peres on his last trip here um, to write about his visit. Uh, this is a very different kind of visit, and uh, I'm really happy to be here in front of all of you and uh, to speak to you about Israel and about Israeli politics. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction about how the system of government works in Israel and what's going on in Israeli politics. Um, as I'm sure you're all somewhat aware of, we're having a bit of a crazy year in Israeli politics. Uh, normally, I would have a graph here for you, a chart where you could see who the different parties are and who the different ministers are. And I can't make you a chart like that because we've not had a government for almost a year at this point. Um, so. Uh, I'll start by explaining a little bit how, how the Israeli system works in broad strokes, and then we'll get more specific about the parties and how Israel got into the mess that it's in today. Um, also, I, I realize that English is not the first language for most of you. Is this, do I need to slow down, or are you okay? We are okay. We are okay. Good. Okay. What, what, excuse me. Yes. What about having half the speed that you are using? <laughs> I will try. I think I, I, I thought I could uh, understand American English, but not with your speed. <laughs> okay, I will try. I will try to slow down. Um, and if I am really speeding up, then someone could yeah. sort of raise their hand and make a note of it because. I, I, because yes, I, I speak fast even yes. even for English speakers. Um, so in any case, I will begin with explaining generally how the system works, and then we will get more specific about who the different people are uh, and how we got into the mess that we're in right now in Israeli politics. Um, so imagine it's election day in Israel. Uh, we've had two this year already. Um, and you show up to your voting booth, um, and you, you show your ID on the way in, and you get behind a screen. And behind that screen in front of you, you have a tray. And the tray has little piles of little slips of paper about this big, about the size of like a smartphone screen. And um, each pile has slips of paper that say the names of different parties. And there's about 30 different piles. You have to pick which party you want out of those. You know, sometimes there's more than 30, sometimes there's less. Um, you pick which one you want. You put it in an envelope, you come out from behind the screen, you drop it in a box. So the way it works in Israel is you're choosing a party and you're not choosing a candidate. And everybody across the country is making the same choice. So there's no regional elections in Israel. There are local municipal elections. That's separate. Um, for the Knesset, it's a national election. Um, so you just choose the party you want. And then the votes are counted. Um, we have a 3.25% electoral threshold. So any party that got less than 3.25% of the vote, those votes, I wouldn't say they don't count, but those votes are not getting into the Knesset. And then the Knesset is divided up proportionally uh, between the parties and how many votes they got. Now, there are 120 seats in the Knesset. Um, I'm going to ask a, a difficult trivia question. A lot of Israelis don't even know this. Anyone know why 120? So 120 um, was the number of people. Tribes. What? Tribes. That's I get that answer a lot. Uh, but 120 was the number of the people in what was called the Great Assembly, uh, which was a sort of council of rabbis 2,000 years ago, the last time there was Jewish sovereignty in Israel. Um, and people know them. Mainly, nowadays, people know them in part because they compiled the Jewish prayer book, the Sidur, um, that Jews use to this day with slight variations depending on uh, different Jewish diasporas. But the basis was compiled by these people. Um, so when Israel was established, this number 120 was chosen uh, to be a connection to Jewish history in the land of Israel. Um, and now, you know, if you ever meet an Israeli, you can uh, dazzle them with this trivia fact that I found that Israelis actually don't know either. So in any case, there are 120 seats. Uh, the votes are divided up. It's proportional. Uh, and to this day, there has never been a majority. Uh, another trivia question. Does anyone know who got the closest to a majority? 
It's an unlikely answer, I would say, because it's not someone who was very popular, but it was Golda Meir um, in the early 1970s. I, I think it was 1972. Um, she got labor under her, got 56 seats, uh, but still no majority. So we've never had one party get a majority of the seats in the Knesset, which means we then need to build a coalition. Um, and the negotiations happen on, you know, what jobs people get, because the, the cabinet members are mostly members of parliament. And um, I will, I'll talk a little more about that soon. Um, and they're also on ideological lines. What kind of policies are they going to promote? Is this government going to be right wing? Is it going to be centrist? Are they going to have to compromise on a lot of things and then maybe not get that much done because they can't agree? Um, you don't know. Now back to the thing about the ministers, um, I'll just make a note here. In Israel, there's something called the mini Norwegian law. Um, what is a mini Norwegian? No, I'm kidding. Um, it's the, in Israel, people really want, uh, many people want the situation in Norway, where if a member of parliament becomes a minister, then they're no longer a member of parliament. But if they have to leave the cabinet, if they're fired from the cabinet or they quit, then they get their seat back in parliament, right? More or less, that's the situation here. Um, so there have been many attempts to bring this to Israel. And they, in Israel, they call it the Norwegian law. Um, it's not succeeded fully. And we have the mini Norwegian law, which has allowed this ha to happen for one minister from every party. Now, you could say to some extent it increases the separation of powers a little bit. That's why it's a mini law. Um, the real reason that they only took the plunge for one minister per party and not fully is uh, because of budgets because then these cabinet members are replaced by all new members of parliament and they all have to be paid and they all get three assistants each and they all get to rent an office outside the parliament. Um, and so it was decided that it was too expensive to do all at once. So we now have a mini Norwegian law. Maybe eventually we will have the full Norwegian law. Um, in any case, uh, I described to you just now what happens normally in an election and how negotiations usually take place. Um, usually the head of the largest party gets the first shot at forming a coalition. And up until this year, historically, that person has always managed. It's either the head of the largest party or sometimes it's the second largest party if he has more people supporting him. He or she, usually he, uh, so far. And um, in this year, uh, the deadline came, in April, we had an election. Um, Netanyahu was leading the negotiations. Um, the two parties, uh, Likud, Netanyahu's Likud and uh, Benny Gantz's Blue and White were tied, but Netanyahu had support from more parties, so he led the negotiations. Um, after six weeks, he couldn't get uh, enough people to join his government to have a majority, um, and I will explain why very soon, uh, but I'm just explaining the process at the moment. Um, and in theory, what the law says is at this point, the, the, the mandate to build a government automatically goes to the next likely person. So it would have gone to Gantz, but instead the Likud went to the Knesset and passed a law to dissolve the Knesset, to call a new election. Um, and that's why we had a second election this year. Um, the second election, the results were not very different from the first election, but they were different enough to make it even more difficult for Netanyahu to form a coalition. Um, and so now um, Netanyahu couldn't form a coalition, and now it's Gantz's turn of the Blue and White Party. He has less support than Netanyahu in the parliament, um, but he is looking for all kinds of other solutions. Now. How did we get in? Oh, and I should explain, if Gantz fails, um, there's then a, a period of 21 days where anybody could become prime minister as long as they can get the majority of the parliament to support them, any member of parliament, I mean. Um, it's unlikely that some random name is going to pop up and some Knesset member that you've never heard of will suddenly become prime minister. Um, if something happens in those 21 days, it'll probably still be Netanyahu or Gantz. They're still considered contenders then. but. Um, I, I, how did we get into this crazy mess where uh, it's possible that in another month or so uh, or a month and a half, we might go to a third election in less than a year or a third election will be called for in less than a year. Um, so it all started 
literally a year ago. It was early November 2018 uh, when Avigdor Lieberman, head of the Israel Beitenu party, resigned from uh, Netanyahu's coalition. Now, the Israel Beitenu party um, is a right-wing party. Uh, uh, Lieberman was for many years Israel's foreign minister and in most more recent years from 2016 to 2018 he was Israel's defense minister um, and unlike the other right-wing parties in in the Knesset um, he is a secularist now in Israel we have freedom of religion but we don't have separation of religion and state um, and there are are religious services, not just Jewish services, also for Muslims and Christians, uh, but obviously since the Jews are 80% uh, of the country, the, the Jewish side of things often dominates the conversation. Um, so uh, there are religious services that are sponsored, paid for by the government. Um, and there are certain things that the religious sectors in society, um, there's consideration given to them. So. Lieberman is is secularist and he wants more of a separation of religion and state. And then on the other side, we have the ultra-Orthodox parties. Um, there's two ultra-Orthodox parties. Um, one is called Shas, the other is called United Torah Judaism. Um, for our purposes, I'm going to talk about them as one because in the issues I'm going to discuss, they have the same positions and, and they do have the same positions for in most areas. Um, so these parties or th this sector of Israeli society, the ultra-Orthodox sector of Israeli society, has long been given consideration, as I had called it, um, that they don't have to enlist in the Israeli army. Um, I'm sure many of you know that when Israelis turn 18, there's a mandatory, there's mandatory military service. Um, there are civilian alternatives that people can do, uh, but you know, for the most part, Israeli Jews, when they're 18, they're supposed to go to the army. Uh, Israeli Arabs can volunteer for the army. Very few do, but some some do. Um, but since the establishment of Israel, since 1948, uh, an exception has been made for the ultra-Orthodox. Now, at the time, there was uh, a very specific logic for that, for that time. Um, it was right after the Holocaust. Um, the huge centers of Torah study, of Jewish religious study throughout Europe had been destroyed, and the huge Jewish communities throughout Europe had been mostly destroyed. Um, and some of the major rabbis who were in Israel said, we want to rebuild these yeshivas, these centers of religious study here in Israel, and we want to have people who can dedicate their lives to this kind of study and, and do this full time. Um, and at the time, it was about 400 people. And uh, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, said, OK, I'll give you that exception for the people who are going to be in these yeshivas and they're going to learn Torah full time. There's even though Ben-Gurion was a very, very secular man, he saw value in continuing this tradition and this history. Uh, you know, 71 years have passed since then, um, and the numbers have become inflated to tens of thousands of people. Yes. Um, the, not just a high, there, there's a high birth rate and also changes in societal expectations, whereas back then it was only the absolute geniuses who went to study full time. Now, it, the norm is to study full time. And then if you're just like really not good at studying, then you don't. Um, so things have become reversed. Um, and in Israeli society, many of the secular Israelis or the more <coughs> modern Orthodox, as opposed to the ultra Orthodox, um, have become resentful, have said that it's not fair. Um, you know, it shouldn't be just us who have to risk our lives. Um, and also, you know, that we're paying for these people who spend full time studying. Um, and this has become a political issue in Israel for over 20 years. Um, about 20 years ago, there was a Supreme Court ruling that said that Israel needed to come up with a more egalitarian sort of way to deal with this issue. Um, and there have been various Supreme Court rulings over the years that the laws that the government have passed haven't really worked. Now there are a few thousand ultra-Orthodox young men who enlist in the IDF every year, but compared to the many, many more thousands who don't, um, you know, so this is still a political issue and it's still an issue with the Supreme Court. So last year there was a, uh, a September deadline that was extended to December of 2018 to pass a law that would that was supposed to really greatly increase the number of um, ultra-Orthodox or Haredi young men coming into the IDF. Um, however, there was a big 
political argument happening be- in, within Netanyahu's right wing coalition between Lieberman, who, um, oh, what I didn't mention before, he's secularist and he also represents immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Um, he himself is from what is now Moldova, um, and his party appeals. His his political base is, you know, the is some of the over a million Israelis who came from the former Soviet Union. Um, and he really does a lot of effort, a lot of campaign work in that community specifically. Um, and they're very secular and also very dedicated to serving in the army. They have very, very high enlistment rates. Um, in any case, Lieberman really insisted on this and he was defense minister. So he went into the defense ministry and he had a professional bill drawn up um, with the professional considerations of the army, what they need, how many people, what kind of considerations can be made for them. For for example, uh, you know, the, the modesty law Laws of very religious people, um, you know, of that they don't necessarily want to have to work with women a lot or things like that. Like, what can be done for consideration for them? Um, but the ultra orthodox party said, no, it's still too much. It's too many people, um, and they especially took issue uh, with there being a uh, a punishment. You know, that it's not just uh, carrots. It's not just incentives to get people to join the IDF, but they were also going to be uh, a punishment for the yeshivas for the 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 schools that if not enough if if not enough ultra orthodox men come into the IDF then some of the budget for those yeshivas would be cut and that was the part that the ultra orthodox parties could not stand for um, while this argument is going on and the clock is ticking and the deadline the September deadline is coming then they got a postponement to December but the clock was ticking there wasn't a lot of time they had to come to some kind of compromise um, things heated up in Gaza and last year, I believe it was in October, but I don't remember the exact date, um, we had the day, the record-breaking day of the most rockets shot from Gaza into Israel. Um, and it was, it was hundreds of them. And Lieberman, um, Lieberman resigned from the government because of that, because he felt he was defense minister. He wanted a more robust military response to the rockets. Uh, but the defense minister can't make these decisions on his own. There's a security cabinet. So there's a broader cabinet of all the ministers, 20 something ministers, usually depending on you know the year and the political situation. Uh, but there's a narrower security cabinet that votes on matters of national security. And Lieberman, who's always been quite hawkish, uh, was getting outvoted time and again. Um, Netanyahu had other considerations in mind. He didn't want to you know, go in and start a full-fledged military operation. Uh, most of what had been done were sort of pinpoints with, you know, you, the Air Force pinpointing certain targets, um, places where rockets were shot from, uh, places where Hamas commanders were working, things like that. And Lieberman wanted something broader. After a while, Lieberman was frustrated with being outvoted, or at least that's his side of the story. Um, I say it's his side of the story because security cabinet meetings are closed. Um, and some of his political rivals dispute his version of events. But since we're talking about politics, at least I can say that the political image he wanted for himself is that he was the hawk and the rest of the people were weak and not listening to him. And that's what he said is why he quit. Um, that began, now Netanyahu still had a majority after that. Um, Netanyahu had had a coalition of 66 seats. Lieberman had five seats. He still had 61 left, but it began uh, a cycle. It, it snowballed, basically, where, you know, it, his coalition became weaker. He had a majority of only one seat, which is still very hard to maintain. Um, and more and more demands were coming up. Um, the Haredim you still weren't compromising on any kind of law for enlistment, and something had to be done because of this court order from the Supreme Court. Uh, and eventually the coalition just became too unruly, and six weeks later, an election was called. Now, there was supposed to be an election this year. Actually, there was legally the election would have had to have been this week. Um, or, yes, this week. It would have had to have been on Tuesday. Uh, but uh, it's pretty normal in Israel for elections to be called early. Uh, nobody thought it was that unusual that the election was going to be in April, um, about seven months before you know the normal time. And in fact, this was a government that had lasted for four years. That's For Israel, that's pretty good. That's, that's a long time. Um, so nobody thought anything of it. People thought there was going to be an election. Um, it, it looked to me throughout on the polls that Netanyahu had a majority on the right. 
um, about the same as he had before. Of you know, he had sixty six seats before, um, and you know, it just looked like things were going to go smoothly. And the election itself did go smoothly. Um, the sort of new big development was this new block called Blue and White was formed. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about Blue and White and Likud. Okay, Likud at this point is the most well-known Israeli party because they've been in power for the past 10 years, but also uh, since 1977, which is the first time they came in power, they have been in power for the majority of the years, um, a significant majority of the years. Um, so Likud is well-known. They're the center right-wing party. So they're, they're the moderate right-wing party in Israel, right? Um, prime Minister Netanyahu, he's been prime minister for 10 years now. Um, I'll slow down again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Netanyahu has been prime minister for 10 years now. Um, they're a party that is, they want to, you know, on domestic issues, they want to free up the markets more in Israel. Um, you know, when Israel started, it was a very controlled economy um, and Likud's for more freeing up. That was a big thing that Netanyahu did the first time he was prime minister in the 90s. Um, they're very traditional on religious matters. They don't want to mess with the status quo too much on matters of religion and state, uh, which is why the ultra-Orthodox parties like to work with Likud. Um, and uh, when it comes to diplomatic issues, um, they, they tend to be tough. They don't want to make big concessions. Um, but historically, actually, all concessions of land have been made by Likud prime ministers. So they are willing to talk about peace, let's put it that way. Um, Netanyahu, of course, has made very little by way of concessions as prime minister. Famously, he conceded on Hebron, but it was agreed upon before he became prime minister. So there is that. Um, in any case, over the years, certainly over the past decade, the Likud has drifted more and more to the right, uh, especially on the issue of Palestinians and concessions being made. Um, and it tracks with Israeli society moving more and more to the right. Polls show the majority of Israel hold what's considered right-wing positions in Israel. Um, if you ask an Israeli what's right-wing, what's left-wing, they're not going to talk about um, you know, socialism and capitalism, which even though I just mentioned that a little bit myself, um, usually when Israelis say right wing or left wing, they're talking about how, many con how much concessions the person is willing to make towards the Palestinians, how much land basically they're willing to give up, whether they want a Palestinian state or not. Um, and so the further you get to the right, the less people are willing to give up. The further you move to the left, the more people are willing to give up. The left, except for the most extreme left, the left is for a two-state solution. There are some like real extremists who want one state that's not a Jewish state, but that's they're barely represented in the Knesset. I'm not going to talk much about that. The, the left and the center in Israel wants two states. Um, the right in Israel generally wants um, sort of autonomy for the Palestinians um, without having to clear out, uh, evacuate any of the Jewish towns in Judea and Samaria or settlements in the West Bank. Everyone can choose how, what they want to call it. <laughs> um, so Likud is on the right there. Um, briefly, Netanyahu uh, in 2009, Netanyahu said he was for a Palestinian state that would be demilitarized. Um, he's mostly backed down from that now. And even at the time, and this is a story Netanyahu himself tells, um, you know, Joe Biden was vice president of the U.S. And he said to Netanyahu, uh, you know, you could call that a state if you want, but that thing you described is not really a state. So Netanyahu says now, even then I wasn't for two states. Again, He's a politician, so uh, I, I give you all the background and what he says, and you can judge for yourselves what you think, whether he was for two state or not, two states or not. At the moment, he's really he's backed down from his 2009 speech. Um, so that's in a, a very brief nutshell where the Likud and Netanyahu stand at the moment. Um, the other major party is the Blue and White Party. Now, the Blue and White Party or the Blue and White Bloc, really, they came together before the April election. Um, the, the central sort of unit in that bloc was a party called Yesh Atid. They're a centrist party. Um, and they were led by Yair Lapid. Yair Lapid was a, a famous um, media figure, I would say. He, was, he wrote a weekly column 
in what was then Israel's most read newspaper. And it was not not a politics column. It was a lot of like personal slice of life. He would touch on politics sometimes, but it was a lot about his life. Um, and he was a talk show host for a while. He was the anchor of the most popular news program in Israel. So he had a he had a mix of the sort of serious, more serious journalism and lighter journalism. And he was very, very famous in Israel. He was like a huge celebrity. Um, and he was also the son of Israel's former justice minister. Um, so he, in 2012, decided to enter politics himself. Um, and he formed the centrist party and a huge part of its campaign was secularist and they were actually in the government from 2013 to 2015 and they insisted on being without the ultra orthodox um so that that's important when it comes to the sort of uh huge knot that needs to come undone right now with the politics is that yeshatid was viewed as an anti-religious party um i think anti-religious might be an exaggeration for what they are but that certainly was their image for a long time and, and to some extent remains it. Um, now, on the Palestinian issue, just to touch on it, um, they're sort of in a position that I think a lot of the Israeli political center is in, that they are for a Palestinian state in theory. In other words, they think in the long run there will be a two-state solution. They don't really think that anything can happen right now uh, with the current Palestinian leadership. Um, Lapid's idea specifically is to internationalize it and to bring in um, sort of make make an agreement with broader with the broader Arab world, uh, especially right now the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia are a little friendlier to Israel and then maybe that will pressure the Palestinians to do something, um, which I think is a plan that has some merits to it. Um, in any case, uh, Lapid and his Yeshatid party, they are about Half, almost half the seats in the Blue and White Party. Uh, but the leader of the Blue and White Party is someone named Benny Gantz, who is new to politics. He just announced he was running to Knesset less than a year ago. Um, but he was well known because he was the former chief of staff of the IDF. Now, contrary to Israel's reputation, um, you know, you could count on one hand the amount of former IDF chiefs of staff uh, who were prime ministers in Israel and even top generals. Um, you know, Netanyahu was an officer, but he wasn't a top general. Uh, he was an officer and he had some, he has some heroic stories. I, I will give him credit for that, but he wasn't an IDF chief of staff. Um, you know, and, and before him, Olmert had no, you know, impressive military record to speak of, et cetera. There's a lot of Israeli prime ministers who are not military people, even though people think that politics are dominated by the military in Israel. Uh, but Gantz, comes in and he is automatically popular. Um, he has this sort of, I would call like a, a bumbling charisma. He's not like Netanyahu who, who gets up and has this booming voice and gives a politician speech. Uh, Gantz has this charisma of like a simple man who wants to have a conversation with you. He seems like one of the people. So it's a very different kind of style from Netanyahu who who is, you know, gives off the, the air of someone who is elite and that has a positive, you know, in a leader, uh, but also, you know, some people prefer the Gantz style. So there's two different, very different styles here. Um, politically, people didn't really know where he stood because, you know, in the military, you're not supposed to talk politics. There were a few things he said that people on the right said, oh, he's like a, a peacenik, you know, he's a dove, but you couldn't really pin him down. Um, so when he entered politics, he also would say about himself, I'm not right wing, I'm not left wing, I'm for Israel, which, what does that mean, really? Um, but the problem was, as we were moving towards the first election, gotta make sure, okay, as we were moving towards the first election, um, both Lapid and Gantz were seen as the main competitors to Netanyahu, and so the votes were being split between them which means that no one of them was strong enough to unseat Netanyahu. So they decided to join forces, and they also brought in a small uh, right-wing moderate party um, led by also former IDF chief of staff Moshe Ya'alon, who had been defense minister under Netanyahu. He had about 10 years of experience in politics at that point, um, and his party was pretty much made up of right-wing people who used to work with Netanyahu, and it ended badly. That's basically, he has five seats in the Knesset, three out of those five seats 
are people that that describes them. They're ideologically right-wing people who don't like Netanyahu um, for, for varying reasons. Um, so this block all joined together. Um, I think that, you know, Likud in their campaign, because that's how political campaigns work, accused them of being very left-wing. I think that they are a solidly centrist party with some members pulling to the left and some members pulling to the right. Um, but And its leadership is fairly centrist if you're talking about the Israeli spectrum. Um, so in April, Blue and White and Likud, the two big blocks, were tied. Um, but there were there was a majority for the right. And all the parties on the right said, we support Netanyahu. Um, they, they have to tell the president of Israel, and then the president is the one who appoints appointed Netanyahu to form the government. Negotiations came along, and then Lieberman suddenly decided to be difficult again. Uh, Lieberman said, I'm not going to, I supported you to be the person to form this government, but I'm not going to join your coalition unless you get the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox parties to compromise and to pass a law for enlistment and to make sure that they don't pass any further laws limiting um, commerce and transportation and things like that on Saturdays. Um, in Israel, basically all this, almost all businesses are closed on Saturdays because that's the Jewish holy day of the week. Um, and the, the ultra-Orthodox wanted to pass more laws to limit more things like to force, for example, supermarkets to be closed and things like that. Um, so Lieberman wanted to curb, basically, the Haredim from pushing their agenda. The ultra-Orthodox wouldn't agree to that. Netanyahu was caught in the middle, and he thought, okay, I'll call another election, I'll do well next time, you know, we'll campaign really hard, we'll be fine, and I'll build another good coalition. Well, it turns out there are enough people on the right wing who are secularists um, who liked that Lieberman stood up to the ultra-Orthodox, that Lieberman ended up with three extra seats. He now has eight seats in the Knesset after the election uh, in September. Um, and the Likud has one seat less than blue and white. Um, and without Lieberman, Netanyahu, the right wing has only 55 seats in total, which is not a majority. And so that's how we started these negotiations right now. That's, that's where we are. Netanyahu has a 55-seat block of right-wing parties. They have promised that they're going to support him and only him. Um, if Netanyahu decides to be in a government together with Gantz, which we would call a national unity government in Israel, then the right-wing will go with him. Um, Gantz doesn't like that. He says he doesn't want to be an appendix on a right-wing government, you know, just this thing that's added on. He wants, you know, he's a candidate for prime minister. He wants to have real power. Um, now, there's another problem here, which I have not mentioned yet, which is that uh, Netanyahu has a lot of legal problems. Um, over the past few years, um, there have been several investigations uh, into his actions, um, a lot of it actually involving the media. Um, it, I could talk for an hour about uh, just about this topic, so I'm going to talk very, very, very briefly. Um, one is he met with a very powerful, a head of a very powerful media conglomerate who wanted him to change a law um, to benefit him, and um, Netanyahu didn't do it, um, but he sort of entertained the meeting and, and didn't say to him no, or and then didn't report it. And the attorney general seems to think that this is an attempted, that, that this is breach of trust, that maybe this person is trying to bribe Netanyahu and Netanyahu didn't report it. The other one is that um, Netanyahu was communications minister for a short time, and um, he changed a certain regulatory situation that benefited a different media conglomerate. Um, and Netanyahu is friends with the owner of that, or friendly with the owner of that media conglomerate. And Netanyahu's spokesman would call that owner of the media conglomerate and say to him, change this picture. It's a bad picture of Netanyahu or Netanyahu's wife or change this headline. It's negative. Um, and so he's also, the question is, is this a quid pro quo or is this just normal media politician things? You know, is this a bribe where Netanyahu changed the situation or are these just two different things that happened? So I don't have the answers. Um, I can tell you that I don't have any money or anything to offer any politicians, and I get called and yelled at all the time for writing negative things. Um, but 
Um, obviously, this is a different situation at a much larger scale of power. Um, and so uh, the earlier this year, the Attorney General of Israel recommended um, charging Netanyahu with fraud, breach of trust, and bribery. Now, this isn't an indictment yet. Um, there was a hearing recently, and it's going to take some time until there's a decision on an indictment. Um, some have said the decision is going to come mid-November. Some have said that the attorney general is in no rush. The attorney general himself is not, I would say, he, he doesn't work in the most transparent way until he's finished. Once he's finished, he releases all the documents. But when he's working, he doesn't, you can't just call him and be like, when are you done? When are you going to finish already? He's not saying, he said, I'm going to take as long as I need um, to do this right. Uh, and to some extent, this is, puts the whole political situation in limbo. Um, the, you know, Gantz and the Blue and White Party, they don't want to be in a coalition with Netanyahu as long as, you know, this, they call it a cloud, a cloud of suspicions is over Netanyahu. Um, they, they don't want to be in a coalition with Netanyahu when there's a recommended indictment, and certainly not if it becomes an actual indictment. Um, you know, they, they, and they've campaigned on sort of anti-corruption, pro-rule of law. Um, so, this makes it very difficult. And so they've been willing to compromise slightly now, which all of the negotiations between Likud and Blue and White have been that there would be a rotation for prime minister, that one of them would be prime minister half the time, the other would be the other half. So Netanyahu wants to be first because he wants to go into his trial as prime minister because he thinks that will be an advantage. Um, you know, uh, hopefully our judges judge fairly whether the person's prime minister or not. But on the other hand, there's a consideration of how it will affect the country. And also as prime minister, it would be three judges, um, whereas if he's not prime minister anymore, it would be one judge. So there's a logic to him wanting to be prime minister when he goes on trial, even though, you know, should he be dragging the whole country along with him while he deals with his legal issues is a different question. Um, whereas Gantz and Blue and White say, we don't want our prime minister to be on trial. We want our prime minister to be focused on running the country. So Gantz should be first. And then in a year or two, when this issue is over, Netanyahu can be prime minister again. And that'll be the rotation agreement. So at the moment, the negotiations are barely happening. There are meetings. They don't get very far because they can't crack these two issues. They can't crack who's going to be first. Um, and it all has to do really with this, uh, with these corruption accusations, and also that Netanyahu is sticking to his block of the. He wants the whole right wing to come with him, not just his own party. Now, part of the reason for this block thing, I should mention, should have mentioned before, um, is that if the block breaks up, then there's a chance that Gantz could build some kind of coalition without the Likud. The way things stand now, Gantz doesn't really have a coalition without Likud. Um, there's some talk about him trying to build a minority government. I don't know, is that a possibility in your system here that there can be a minority government? Okay, so there's some talk about that. Um, the Part of the issue of that is that it would require support from the joint list, which is the um, mostly Arab party in the Knesset. Um, and it, it's not about them being Arabs, but it's about them um, being uh, an anti-Zionist party that they believe that Israel shouldn't be a Jewish state. Um, now, it's very hard to, and also they have a lot of alliances um, to groups that are actively hostile to Israel, whether it's Hezbollah or Hamas in some cases. Um, some, of the, some of the Knesset members from this Arab bloc are friendly with those groups, not all, but some. Um, and so to some, this is really considered a red line. And even within blue and white, there's a huge debate over whether they should even, as a negotiating tactic, say that this option is on the table. So I don't think it's a very serious option, although you never know. Um, and it happened 25 years ago uh, with former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. He had support from the Arab Party. Um, but as it stands, Likud and blue and white need each other. Neither one is willing to compromise and help the other. And um, I think as the way it stands today, or then the way it stood for the past week, that is that we're heading towards a third election. Now, as an Israeli, I really hope that the politicians will wake up and compromise. But at the moment, it looks pretty hopeless. <laughs> so, um, and the, the sad thing is that, or the 
the crazy thing really is that the polls show that things aren't going to be so different if there's another election. The the latest polls show are almost identical to the outcome of the September election, although you never know after a campaign. So that's more or less where we are in Israeli politics, a little bit of a summing up what's, go- what's going on at the moment. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, I've not, I didn't talk about every single party and every single political issue, so if there's something specific that I skipped that you're interested in, just let me know. So I have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I uh, saw a um, few, I, I think it was a month ago, uh, some uh, member of the Likud party mm-hmm. who said that he could replace Netanyahu. If it was to come to that, uh, what, what do you think is the likelihood of Likud abandoning Netanyahu because of his legal issues? Okay, so uh, what is the likelihood of Likud abandoning Netanyahu because of his legal issues? I think Blue and White really hoped that that would happen um, by now, uh, but it's not happened. And so I think, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, But there are some voices, some people saying, you know, after Netanyahu is gone, I'm going to run to be the leader of the Likud, which was something that people weren't even really saying. until recently. They, well, people would, wouldn't even dare say that there is going to be a time that Netanyahu is going to be gone because it would be perceived as disloyal to Netanyahu. Um, so Blue and White has been putting the pressure on, on senior members of Likud and telling them, you know, you guys need to get rid of Netanyahu. He's the reason that we're not forming a coalition, which I don't think is completely true, but it's certainly partially true. It's There's definitely a fair argument to be made that if somebody else was head of Likud, we probably would not go to a third election. Um, Even though I don't think it's all Netanyahu's fault, I think Lieberman, for example, plays a big role here. Uh, But in any case, um, Netanyahu had a plan to sort of sway blue and white from trying to mess within Likud. And he wanted to call a leadership vote in Likud so that he would get reelected and he would say, I mean, to begin with, he's the elected leader, so he has legitimacy, but to sort of even have even stronger legitimacy um, in these negotiations. The party institutions said, no, you can't do that. Um, It costs too much money. It's just pointless. Um, And so Netanyahu backed down. But in the half day, literally half a day, in which this option was on the table, um, somebody in the party, his name is Gidon Saar, he wrote on Twitter, I'm ready, which people interpreted and he later admitted meant that he's going to run against Netanyahu. Now, Gidon Saar um, for many years was considered the front runner, the sort of the person who was going to be next after Netanyahu. Um, and because of that, Netanyahu didn't like him. Um, he felt that Saar was undermining him. Um, and Saar even took a break from politics because he felt that it had gone very ugly sort of within the Likud and with Netanyahu. Uh, but he came back this year for the first election this year. Um, and now he's in Likud, even though Netanyahu is, uh, he and Netanyahu are openly hostile to each other. Although I will say that despite that hostility, Saar deserves credit for being a team player and campaigning well for the Likud. And, you know, but uh He disagrees with Netanyahu on a lot, and he doesn't hide it. Um, After Saar made that statement, that, of course, puts him ahead of the other five or six people who think that they could be the heads of Likud. Um, And so a couple of them have since come out with those statements that once Netanyahu is gone, I will run to replace him. Um, Basically, I think that in this round of negotiations, you know, between now and mid-December, when an election would theoretically be called, I don't think Netanyahu will be gone. Um, I think um, for a long time, people thought that if Netanyahu was indicted, he would be gone. But a lot of it was based on 
the coalition politics, that the other parties in his coalition would say, we don't want a prime minister who's under indictment. But now he's in what's called an interim government. He has no coalition, so he doesn't have anyone to push him out until there's a real government. How is the situation calling for uh, the security of the state of Israel? How is that situation do we, do we, Is it very bad? Is it very? Is it okay? Okay, so how does the situation impact Israel's security? Um, I'm sure you're all aware that the Middle East is uh, in chaos, even more than usual at the moment, um, between Syria and Iran growing stronger. Um, so th this situation is not good for Israel's security. Israel is, is managing, but it's not great um, because there's no sort of stability of who's going to be in charge in the short term to deal with these um, issues, and also because the budget is basically frozen. So if the IDF wants to, you know, develop something new, buy something, spend money in some other way that it needs to, um, it, it, you know, there, there are ways to get around and to try to get transfer that money, but it, it's difficult. There's no set um, budget for which they can plan for the coming years of, you know, what they're going to buy, what kind of defensive weapons, strategies, etc. they're going to develop. Um, and so that's a huge issue, is that the parliament is frozen, the budget is frozen. This is also an issue with all sorts of social services in Israel, but also with, with the army. Okay, then we can say thank you so much for a highly interesting uh, speech. Thank you.